So let's look at this whole idea of a Sabbath rest, which is found, again, in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. Uh, The word Sabbath means to cease. It means to stop everything you're doing and to do something completely different. It's a holy day. It's a different kind of day. Interestingly, the term holiday comes from the two words holy day. Holidays are supposed to be different kinds of days. The problem of stress in our culture is huge. Practically all of us deal with it at some level or another. God created work to be good, but in the fall it became bad. And it has started to consume so many of us. We're exhausted mentally, emotionally, physically. What's the root of stress? I would suggest to all of you today that the root of stress is the perversion of work. The root of stress is a performance-based mentality that I must do to be accepted, that I must perform in order to earn, that I'm a human doing, not a human being. And therefore, we see as power, prestige, success, prominence, uh, possessions, all of those things our world clamors for as being what drives us in order to prove our worth to the world. Our work then becomes our worth. Or to put it another way, let me ask you to fill in the blank on this particular phrase. The quality and quantity of blank defines me. Think about it. Fill in the blank. The quality and quantity of blank defines me. And I'd suggest to you that whatever you put in that blank is what's causing your stress. You keep pushing and pushing and pushing to have blank, which defines your sense of worth. You're measuring up to some standard that you have imposed upon your life. And it drives you to perform. A cottage industry has come around this problem of stress in our culture. And you in your workplace have seminars or other places on things like meditation, biofeedback, time management, exercise, dieting, assertiveness training, margins in your life values clarifications and how to prioritize your life. All all of those teachings are really addressing the problem of how to handle stress in your life. The Roman poet Horace, centuries ago, wrote these words. No one lives content. No one lives content. Even in the Roman Empire... A couple of thousand years ago, he wrote, no one lives content. When we sleep at night, sleep therapists tell us that unless we have REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, we'll awaken the next morning and be completely fatigued. I would like to suggest to you today that there's an REM for the soul. There is a kind of rest for the soul that unless we get it, We're going to live our lives exhausted in this world today. What is that rest? Let me share it with you. First of all, it is the weekly Sabbath rest that God intended for us all. As we've looked through the book of Leviticus together, this Sabbath is emphasized in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. In fact, let's read it now. Out of reverence for the reading of the Scripture, if you're able... Leviticus chapter 23, 1 through 3, please stand. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, so this is from the Lord, to Moses, and he says, speak to the people of Israel. This command is for the Israelites and say to them, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Now, very quickly, 
the rest of Leviticus 23 is the outline of those seven feasts, those seven holy festivals, those seven convocations that God set apart for the Israelites to have. And next week, we'll look at what those feasts are. Bottom line, there's seven times a year for an entire week when the Israelites are to come together and party hardy. That's what they're supposed to do. They're basically seven weeks that God built into the calendar for the Israelites to take a vacation. So we're going to talk next week about the need to take your vacations, the need to have holidays, holy days, different days set apart for the purpose of renewal and refreshment. But here God talks about, verse 3, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. There's one day God says it's set apart every week, a holy day, a holiday that's different than all of the rest of the days of the week. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath, Shabbat in the Hebrew. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all of your dwelling places. Every Jew everywhere is to live by Shabbat, one day a week for total rest and worship. For the glory of God, the word of the Lord, you may be seated. So you need to know this command from God to Moses in Leviticus 23 really finds its genesis in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let me read to you this part of the creation account. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, different, set apart, because God on it rested from all of his work that he had done in creation. So six previous days, God had created. After each one, he said it's good. But on the seventh day, he rested. He called it a Shabbat, a holy day, a different kind of day. Now, God didn't rest on this day because he needed it. Psalm 121 makes it clear. God neither slumbers nor sleeps. God didn't need the rest. He did it to model for us our need for the rest. After working six full days, we need a day off. To put it another way, if you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. We all need one day out of seven set apart for the purpose of rest. God gave us that model in creation. It's repeated in Leviticus 23, verses 1 through 3. It's a fixed day. It's not optional. It's for everyone. It's a holy day. It's a holiday. And on this Shabbat, on this Sabbath, there is to be no work. There's to be no work. In fact, let me read to you more clearly the specific command among the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting with verse 12. God says in this commandment, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock. God loves ox and donkeys and livestock. Even they should have a day off. Even they should have a day of rest. Or the sojourner who is within your gates. If someone's visiting from another country, they're to honor the Sabbath. They're not to do any work on the Sabbath. That your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day not an option, commanded you to do so. So again, that 
Ten Commandments rooted in creation in Genesis 2 is repeated in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. What is God trying to say to these Israelites from whom he delivered out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt, brought them to Sinai, gave them the Ten Commandments, the moral law, and all the Levitical laws for a personal living relationship with him, calling them to then go live in a godless pagan Canaanite culture, which is basically like our culture in which we live. One seeking after pleasure and passion and not the Lord God himself. And amidst this culture, God says, I want you to be a holy people, a different kind of people. And the Levitical law, as we've studied over the last couple of months, was for a holy people to live differently among the pagans of that world. And God's saying to them, this Sabbath day is a special day as for your rest, but also a witness to that pagan culture. It is to say to them and to you, first of all, all time belongs to me. Every second of every minute of every hour of every day, God is saying, belongs to me. I created time. I own time. Secondly, you belong to me. When you come together, you not only rest, but you also worship me. And as you worship me, you're making a witness to the pagan Canaanite culture that you belong to me. I'm yours and you are mine. They don't have a day set apart like this for rest and worship. You do. And thirdly, God is saying, not only is this day set aside to say I own time and that you belong to me, but thirdly, it's a faith discipline. As this pagan Canaanite culture works and works and works and works and works in order to have more and more and more and more and more, I'm asking you to take one day, set it aside to rest and worship me and see if I won't provide for you in a way you can't begin to explain. Now, can you imagine this week that your boss says to you, I want you to take one day off this week. And during this day, rest assured by my promise to you, that you're going to get a full salary and a full benefit, though you don't have to work. How many of you would take that day? Well, of course you would. That's what God says to you weekly. Cease from your work. Put a day aside and just rest and worship me and just see if I won't provide for you in ways you can't even begin to imagine. That's my solution to stress. God said. Moreover, in Exodus 35, 2, God says, you need to keep this Sabbath day, and if you don't, you should be stoned to death. Now, no one in the Bible was ever stoned to death for not keeping the Sabbath. But it's there, I think, from God's standpoint to say to all of us, God, I'm serious about this. God's saying, I'm serious about this. This is important for you to follow. It has ramifications for your own personal health and for your witness to the world. Do this. So for us today, how do we begin to understand how to have relief from our stress, how to have rest for our souls? God says, first of all, take this day off. Rest. One day out of seven, rest. People ask me all the time, well, what should I do on the Sabbath? (laughs) In Jesus' day, the religious leaders and the Pharisees tried to explain all the things people could do or not do on this day, and they came up with 39 laws on what you could do or not do on the Sabbath. We'll look at that in a little more depth in a second. But there are no laws for the Sabbath. There are no do's and don'ts. It's basically whatever energizes you, what refreshes you. What gives you new life? Is it taking a walk? Go for a walk on the Sabbath. If it's reading a great book, read a great book on the Sabbath. If it's spending time in quiet and meditation and prayer, do that on the Sabbath. Whatever energizes your soul, do it on the Sabbath. From time to time, people ask me, well, can I go to a Panthers game on the Sabbath? And my answer is always the same. Well, first of all, look at this in just a second. Make sure you worship. And we have a Saturday night worship and a 930 worship still gives you time to get to the game. But here's the question. Does going to a Panthers game refresh your soul? Or if the Panthers play poorly (laughs) 
and lose? Is that like bad breath to your soul for the next several days? Does it throw you into a weekly funk because of how poorly they play? Well, if that's the case, don't go to the game. That's not refreshment to you. In fact, it's probably the quality and quantity of the blank. That's probably your blank that's defining you. And listen, some of you guys especially, but some of you girls too, find your identity in your sports teams. And when they lose, it just throws you into a funk. And nothing of this world should ever manipulate your soul like that. Joe Lieberman, former vice presidential candidate here in uh, the United States, wrote a book a couple of years ago on the Sabbath. And he talked about something that he and his wife did every Sabbath that renewed their souls. They purposefully and intentionally disciplined themselves to make sure they made love on the Sabbath. Got your attention now, don't I? (laughs) They would put candles up and the sweet-smelling incense, and they put a time aside every single week when they came together to make love. And he basically said, that energizes us. It creates love in our hearts. We, we looked forward to that time. It's perfectly acceptable. Jonathan Edwards, the great American theologian of a couple of hundred years ago, maybe the greatest American theologian ever, um, he preached every week, and then he would have to do circuit riding throughout the week, and he taught his congregation how after he preached, he'd go home and eat, and then he'd take a nap with his wife. He had 11 children. <laughs> how did they come into the world? Except they had a wonderful Sabbath together. Interestingly, of those 11 children, 10 went into adulthood. And if you did a study of all of those children's impact upon the American nation, you'd be astounded. They became politicians, judges, uh, the most influential people in America. And interestingly, too, by the way, in a parenting tip, Edward spent one hour every day with his children, just talking with them, just being with them, because kids spell love, T-I-M. So whatever energizes you, whatever refreshes you, do that because that will help you address the blank. And it will help you address what one writer calls the inner murmur of discontentment in our souls. Don't you like that? The inner murmur of discontentment in our souls. That which keeps driving us and pushing us for more and more of blank that causes stress. But secondly, not only rest, but also worship. Uh, You saw in Deuteronomy 5.15 a powerful word from God. He said, on this Sabbath, make sure you hear when you come together to worship a message that reminds you that once you were slaves in Egypt, but I delivered you by my mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And I brought you out of that slavery in Egypt into a new relationship with me at Sinai. And what was God trying to say? When you worship together every single week, make sure that you're reminded of the message. You used to be slaves, but now you're my sons and daughters. Remember that you used to be under the bondage of Egyptian slavery, but now, because of my mighty hand and my mighty outstretched arm, you're my sons and daughters in a personal living relationship with me. Because, folks, most of us have stress in our lives because we've got some law that we feel like we've got to measure up to. And if we don't, we have stress. Again, the performance-based mentality, which basically means we're slaves under the bondage of some law that we feel like we've got to live up to. And God says, get rid of that mentality. And remember your sons and daughters, because if you really know that God's your daddy and you're a son and daughter of the king of the universe, especially through Jesus Christ, what law is there you've got to live up to to be loved by him? You're just loved by the daddy in heaven because you're just loved by the daddy in heaven. He's wildly and passionately loving you. And therefore, stress ceases because you're not having to live up to any false standard you've placed in your life to be loved. Some of you have come from churches that didn't preach you the gospel. They preached legalism. 
They preached a standard of morality, do's and don'ts you have to live up to in order for God to love you. But that's not the gospel. And what I've tried to do in 35 years here is to free some of you from legalism that you were taught in the church. You're loved by the Father not by what you do, but what he's done for you on the cross of Calvary. And when you accept Jesus, he enters your heart as the Holy Spirit. And you're now in Romans 8 language, hearing from the Holy Spirit within you that God is your daddy, he's your Abba, he's your father. And fear increases, Paul says in Romans 8, when you fall back under the law and think you've got to live up to some standard. That makes you a slave, not a son or a daughter. So you come together as a group of people to make a witness to the world, to remind yourselves and the world that God owns all time, but mostly to hear the message, you once were a slave under the bondage of sin and death, but now you're a son and daughter living freely in love with your daddy in heaven. Isn't that good news? And every week, you need to go to a place, whether it's here or someplace, where the gospel, the true gospel is preached, reminding us always our identity is not found in what we do, but what's been done for us on the cross of Calvary. So that Sabbath is a special day set apart for rest, refreshment, but also worship. And again, it's a witness to the world. When on Park Road, the officers have to stop traffic for five and ten minutes and let all of you off. That's a witness because you've come together to worship the living God. But not only is there a weekly Sabbath, you need to know through the lenses of the New Testament, through the lenses of the gospel, through the lenses of Jesus, there's a daily Sabbath. And this is the best way to deal with all of our stress in life, is to understand the daily Sabbath. What is it? It's not rest just one day a week, but through Jesus, he calms the inner murmur of all of our discontent. Through Jesus and that personal relationship with him, every second of every minute of every day of every week, we live in God's Sabbath rest. We live in that relationship with him knowing that God loves us not based on what we do, not based on our performance, not based on our discontentment, but based simply on the fact that he chose to die for us and give us eternal life in a relationship with him. That's what Jesus was trying to get at, I think, in Mark, the second chapter. In this encounter, let me read it to you. One Sabbath, Mark 2, 23. Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did? When he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also made it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now now think about the story. Jesus' disciples are hungry. It's on Shabbat, Saturday, the Sabbath. And they go into a grain field and take the grains of the wheat and start mashing them together to eat them. The religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, etc., had 39 laws, remember, that people could or could not do on the Sabbath. One of them was go into a field and take the grain. They looked at Jesus' disciples doing that, and they went, How can they do that? They're breaking the Sabbath law. Jesus responds in several ways. First of all, he reminds them of the story of King David being pursued by Saul. And he goes into the tent of the tabernacle where there's the high priest and the different elements of the high priest's job. One of those elements is called the showbread. It is a daily piece of bread only to be eaten by the priest for the purpose of reminding the priests and all the people who look upon it of God's daily provision, of the manna God gave the Israelites in the wilderness. But when the high priest saw David's men fleeing Saul and so hungry, he gave them the showbread. Here's Jesus' question. Why'd he do that? Then he reminds the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God made the Sabbath as a day to be refreshed and renewed. Man wasn't made to have to work to please God on this special day. 
And then secondly, he says something remarkable. He says, for I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, folks, do you hear what he's saying there? Back to Genesis 2, 1 through 3 that I read to you earlier. Who created the Sabbath? Who created the Sabbath? God created the Sabbath. On the seventh day, he said, I'm making this day as a day of rest. So if God created the Sabbath and Jesus says, I'm Lord over the Sabbath, what's he saying? I'm God. Now, some of you out there are spiritual seekers, and you say about Jesus, he's just a good moral man, a righteous rabbi, someone we should emulate. That's partly true, but you must answer the most important question. Is he God? He claimed to be God. In this claim and many others, he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I created the Sabbath. Before this world was ever created, I made the Sabbath day. And he was either crazy, folks, or he was lying to us, or he's the truth. And if he is the Lord of the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day and every day, you are called to make him Lord and worship him. Here, though, he's saying, if I am the Lord of the Sabbath, and I created the Sabbath, and it's my day that I made, then you guys have completely missed the point for the purpose of the Sabbath. And if Jesus created the Sabbath, and it's a set-apart special day, there's something more in his teachings in the New Testament we need to grab to have rest for our souls, to cease the stress in our lives. What is it? I think it's found in Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 25 through 30. Listen to these words. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. What are these things? The truth about who Jesus is. As the Lord of the Sabbath, God of the universe, the one who died for our sins to be forgiven, who lives inside our hearts, who ushers us into eternity, God did not let the wise and the learned know this truth. He didn't let the academic elites get it. They seldom do. But it was revealed to the little children, to babes. Matthew 18, 2, Jesus looked at children and said, they get the kingdom of God. And unless you have a faith like a child, you're not going to understand the kingdom of God. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he says these words, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find what, folks, what? Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So Jesus says, first of all, If you want to know rest for your souls, a daily Sabbath, where every day, every minute, every second you live in my perfect rest, first of all, you got to be like a little kid. You've got to receive this truth like a little child. You can't intellectually figure it out. Receive it like a child, for such is the kingdom of heaven. One of the great things about being a grandparent is you can observe your grandkids without worrying about how they're behaving. (laughs) You can just enjoy them. And over at Ryan and Bethany's the other night, you know, Anna Grace is almost five and Caleb is around two and a half or so. Just watching them, and Emily is too young, so I'll not include her in this. Watching them behave was just absolutely interesting. You know, they're wonderful children. They're good children in so many ways. But, you know, they could look at their parents when their parents tell them to do something and say the inimitable words that all children say, no. And then demand food whenever they want it like all children do, right? I hungry, mommy, I hungry. And interestingly, no matter how awkward or obstinate they may have been, and again, they're wonderful kids, but no matter how obstinate they may have been, no no matter how demanding they may have been, if after that had happened for maybe even an hour, they run to Ryan or Bethany and they hold up their arms and say, pick me up, what do they do? What do they do? They pick them up. They pick them up. And, and no matter how difficult they may have been, if they say, Mommy, I'm hungry, what happens? They feed them. Why? 
Because children know they're completely dependent on mom and dad. And they know, bottom line, they're really loved. And no matter how obstinate they may have been, mommy and daddy are going to love them. Jesus says you got to be like that. Even though all of us hurt the Father's heart at times, do things that break him, if we go to him and say, pick me up, or, or daddy, I'm hungry, he'll always pick us up because his love is stronger than our sin. He'll always provide for us. Why? Because he is a provider and he loves his children. So Jesus says it all starts there. Believe like a little child that your daddy loves you and will provide for you. Then he says, come to me. Come to me. All of you who are stress-filled, burdened, heavy laden, come to me. Then he says, And put my yoke on your shoulders. See, yokes were for burden-bearing beasts of that day. So an ox or donkey would have a yoke placed on one and then the other. Now, if one died, here's what they would do. They'd take a young, new ox or donkey or whatever and put it in the same yoke as the older one. But they'd always widen the circle of the yoke. Why? Because the young one needed to learn from the older one. And as he learned how to walk lockstep with the older one, he'd find that the older one carried the yoke. And the sores that would be rubbed upon his his shoulders and neck when he did not walk in obedience would cease. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Interestingly, the yoke was a symbol in Jewish society of the law. Jesus said, take my yoke which isn't the law, which is the gospel of grace. And put it on your shoulders and learn to walk with me. Come to me and learn to walk with me. And as you learn to walk with me in lockstep and obedience with my life and my love, you'll find I'm carrying your burdens. The yoke is all on my shoulders. And you'll discover that my yoke is easy and my burden is light because I'm carrying it I'm carrying it and then you'll discover rest for your souls the Sabbath rest is a daily childlike faith that God is carrying everything and we can trust him with it Every day, every second, every minute, they all belong to him. His yoke is carrying all my burdens, and there's rest for my souls. That's why Horatio Spafford, who just lost three daughters, could pin the words to a hymn we sang earlier today, It is well with my soul. Let me turn you now real quickly to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. God promised the Israelites a promised land where they would have ultimate perfect rest. In that land, he would provide for them in every possible way. But the Israelites could not initially enter into that land because of their unbelief. And Hebrews 4 is all about don't let unbelief rob you of the Sabbath rest for your hearts. And then there are these three verses, verses 9 through 11. So then, the writer of Hebrews says... Remember, Leviticus is to be interpreted primarily through Hebrews. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. The people of God who've entered into the Sabbath rest have rested from their inability to obey the law and think that performance is what defines God's love for them. They've stopped that nonsense. Then let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. (laughs) What a crazy statement. It's almost oxymoronic. The writer of Hebrews says, strive to enter rest. Work hard to enter rest. What does that mean? Dear friends, to believe like a child that God is in control and loves us when our lives are exploding and imploding. 
when we might lose children or lose our jobs or whatever, to continue to believe that God is good and that he's loving is hard work. So the writer of Hebrews says, make every effort to continue to believe, to enter into God's rest, that your life's purpose and God's love for you is not based on your performance, but based simply on the fact that God just loves you and the proof is Jesus on the cross. Make every effort to enter into that rest. Final point. Shabbat for the Jews, even to this day, is at the end of the week. You work all the days of the week, then Shabbat, a holy day, is at the end to recover and recuperate from all your hard work. Christians in the early church moved Shabbat from Saturday to Sunday. Why? I mean, why change something that had been in existence for a couple of thousand years? Well, first of all, they'd seen a resurrected Jesus. And they believed Jesus was God. And so they worshipped Jesus on the day when his resurrection was known, Sunday morning. That's one of the reasons it was moved. But here's the second reason. Because Christians believe Shabbat should be not the last day of the week, but the first day of the week. That Shabbat looks forward to what's going to happen. So that whatever you face this next week, you face with the resurrected Christ living inside you. Therefore, there's nothing you'll face this week that God won't face with you. Moreover, not only does Shabbat, through Christian eyes, look forward to the next week, it looks forward to eternity. Where Jesus will come back one day, he is coming back one day, folks. And he will make right all wrongs. And during that perfect sovereign oversight of his new heavens and new earth, we will enter into his perfect eternal rest. We look forward to that day. At my daddy's funeral, the great hymn of the faith was played. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess, thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On this Lord's day, we look forward to his second coming. To him be the glory forever and ever.